buddy. Great to see all of you here. Welcome to Foundations Church. We're happy that you're here. If you've been with us for a really, really long time, welcome. We're just glad to reiterate to you how much you matter to us. And if you've been here for the first time, we want to say welcome. Uh, You matter to us. Most importantly than that, however, more importantly than that, is that you matter to God. And we're glad you took time out of your busy schedule to be with us just to remind us all how much we do matter, okay? So we're really glad you're here. If you want to find out what's going on at the place, there's a connecting table out back. That's great. We're in a series called Resilient, okay? Being resilient. It's the bounce that counts, all right? We got to be bouncy, okay? All right, so because life comes at us fast and furious, the heavyweight, ex-heavyweight champion now turned philosopher, uh, Mike Tyson, um, (laughs) he said, he said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. That's profound, isn't it? All right? You can think everything's good, and then bam, there comes a punch, and, and, and it'll be hard. And so we gotta, we're going to learn how to be resilient. Okay, So that's what we're going to talk about. Last week, we kind of kicked the series off, and we said whenever life del- delivers a sucker punch, there's six stages kind of that we have to go through. And here's the six stages that we have to go through. Today, we're going to talk about shock. And actually, the title of today is how to be shock resistant, okay? Have to have a plan, because life's going to come. Life's going to punch us in the face. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So how can I be prepared for that punch in the face? Then after that, we go through sorrow, okay? Uh, The only way out of hard stuff is to grieve it, but we have to grieve it well so we don't get stuck in it, okay? Then struggle. The struggle is like, eh, eh, am I going to accept this or not? Here's the big deal. The struggle is a big phase. We'll talk about it because in the struggle, we have to decide, like, my life's not working out the way I want it to. Exactly. Because God has a bigger plan for, for us. So the struggle is, am I going to try to push, 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 or am I just going to kind of say, okay, okay, I get it, and I'm going to accept God's plan for me, because even though I don't want to go this way, I just have to trust that his plan is bigger and better than mine, and that's what surrender is, finally surrendering, saying, okay, God, I get it. I didn't expect this. I don't want this. It doesn't feel like the right thing for me, but I'm going to surrender because I'm just going to believe. I don't have any evidence of this. I'm just going to believe, though, that your way is better. And then we're going to talk about sanctification. That's a big church word, fancy word. All it means is this, how to turn bad things into good. That is God's specialty, by the way, taking bad things, taking a mess and turning it into a message, taking a test and turning it into a testimony how God takes bad things and turns it for good. Because why? That's the last message. Service. Service. It's not about us. It's not about us. Last week we said at Foundations Church, we're here to declare war on the biggest problem, I think, plaguing the world, and it's hopelessness. Hopelessness. And so God takes us through all kinds of adversity shows us that he can deliver us from adversity and actually make us better because of it so that we could be a megaphone of hope to a world that desperately needs it. That's why all of us go through all our stuff that we're going through, so that we could get through it, say, wow, wow, actually, this didn't make me a worse person. I'm actually a better person, thank God. And then I could be a megaphone to other people who have gone through the same thing. If you've ever had a marriage that's crashed and burned, You could come talk to someone like me who's had that happen, and I could tell you what, God is good. God is good. He could take something so bad that I thought I could never recover from, turn around for good, and now God can use me and use you to be a megaphone of hope to the world. So so that's what it's all about. So I'm glad you're here, okay? Really glad you're here. We're talking about resilience. That's the title of the message. This tag phrase is, it's the bounce that was my title. The staff voted me down. I'm bitter about it. Okay? All right. Okay. All right. So here's the verse that we're going to talk about today. Let's all stand together. This comes from one of the wisest, one of the wisest men Solomon ever lived from the book of Ecclesiastes. Kind of means preacher. <laughs> and here's what he says. I read the white. You read the yellow. People can when hard times might come. Ain't that true? You can never predict. You can think life is going really, really well. You can never, ever, ever predict when life is going to deliver you. When I was a kid growing up, 
I had a family that was interesting, dysfunctional, but I, ha- I, I got through it pretty well. Every year in my life got better and better. When I was in elementary school, I was a good kid. Junior high, I was a really good kid. High school, I was a stud. Okay, smart. Uh, <laughs> went to college. Just kept going. Everything was good. Went to graduate school. Everything was good. In my 30s, I thought life... I, I adopted the phrase of Norman Vincent Peale, the power of positive thinking. Every day and every way, God and I are getting better and better. Okay, all right? Okay, but I just thought that's the way life worked. And then when I was 42, I got delivered a sucker punch. Knocked me flat, flat on my derriere. I couldn't have predicted it. I couldn't have predicted it. I'll talk about it just a second. It was, it was awful, hard. I thought, I thought my life was just going to just continue to get better and better and better. And then, man, I went to dark down to the valley of the shadow of death. It was bad. You can never predict when hard times come. Like fish in a net or birds in a trap, people are. Yeah, we can be. We can be. It caught me in sudden tragedy. I don't like to say this, but it was so dark. It was so bad. It was so hard. That tragedy was that I was caught. And I'm not happy to say this, but at 42, a strong Christian, a pastor for 15 years, uh, I thought life would be better if I was dead. I didn't want to live anymore. I don't, I don't want to live. I says, God, my world, my family, everybody in my life would be better if you just took my tree and wrapped it around, the, took my car and wrapped it around a tree. I don't be. You, you, can anybody relate to that? I mean, it, it's tough. You, you don't expect it. So today, we're going to talk about how to be prepared for that. We're going to talk about being resilient. Today, we're going to talk about shock, how to be shock resistant, shock proof our lives because it's the bounce that counts. I'm glad you're here. Let's ask God to help us. Father, thank you for every person here. Thank you. I pray that every person here would know that they matter to you. They matter. You, you, you the, no one's here by accident. You formed us, had a plan for us when we were in the womb of our mother. Thank you for that. And life is hard. And life does punch us in the face. So I pray that today you would teach us that that happens in life. Not to make us bitter or angry or complain or blame or be a sourpuss and push everybody out of our life and just embrace our anger and enjoy that space because that's not fun. Rather, you've given us adversity to make us better people, to soften our hearts, to allow your abundant grace to come into the darkness of our life and bring light so that we could be people who are kind and loving and forgiving and understanding and people who have hope so that we can bring our world hope. Ah, that's the kind of God you are, a God of transformation. So may your Holy Spirit fill this room today, hover over every heart, and remind us that you love us, that no matter where we're at in life, we are children, daughters, and sons of our Heavenly Father who've put us on this planet for a purpose, and your plans for us are good. They're good. May we embrace that hope this morning, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you grab a seat, shake the person's hand next to you and say, it's the bounce that counts. Just tell them that. <laughs> the, the, the main events, the, the most influential events in our life the major events in our life, the influential ev- events in life that shape, shape us, come to us as a surprise. They come to us as a surprise. And, and when they come to us, they, they, they don't come to us with nice pretty bows on it. It comes to us in the form of adversity. And, and you can't go around it, and you can't go over it, and you can't go under it. You have to go through it. You have to go through it. So today we're going to talk about shock. I, I was not surprised because the Bible is so practical, so, so amazing how it addresses everyday life. There's a lot of evidence and a lot of situations and examples in the Bible of shock. 
It's amazing. Here, here's one right here. This is from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah says this. You read the yellow. A horrible and shocking, shocking thing has happened. Jeremiah was a prophet over, over the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem. He loved the city of Jerusalem and loved the people in Jerusalem. And God gave him this special gift to be able to see the future. Not everything, though. Even prophets get punched in the face. And so all of a sudden, devastation came to the city of Jerusalem. And when he looked over the devastation of the city, he said, oh my gosh, I'm shocked, shocked at what happened. Another great prophet, Ezekiel. So the enemy came in and took people from Jerusalem and removed them, refugees. Moved into a different land and they were refugees. And Ezekiel was kind of like a prophet and a pastor and he wanted to check on the conditions of his people who were refugees. And so he said, came to the colony of Judean refugees in Tel Aviv beside the river Kibar. You read the yellow. I was overwhelmed, shocked, shocked at how bad and desperate my people were doing. I was overwhelmed and sat among them for seven days. I like that because it reminds me that when you're shocked, you can't do anything. You just can't even move. You, it, it, to get out of bed and in the shower when you're shocked is a victory. It's just, you just can't do it. You're just overwhelmed. You can't even move. It's like, wow, shocked and overwhelmed. And then, and we'll give you one more. This is King David, who, who the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. I thought, wow, God, <laughs> if David's a man after God's own heart, there's hope for me because David was a rascal. I think, wow, man, God overlooks a lot of stuff to call that guy a murderer and an adulterer. A man after God's own heart. That gives me hope. It gives me hope. And here, here's what the man after God's own heart said. My enemy has chased me. He punched me in the face and knocked me to the ground and forces me to live in darkness like those in the grave. I'm losing all hope. I'm paralyzed with... You can't do anything. You can't do anything when you're shocked. Like I say, if you, if, if you get a shower that day, that's a victory. It's hard, hard to do anything, and it's just paralyzed. And so, so we're going to talk about shock. Today. We're going to talk about it in three forms. Okay, three. Here's our outline for today. Because some of us may know somebody in a crisis like that. What do you do for somebody who's in shock? And we'll talk about that today. Okay. Some of us may be here today, and you're in a crisis. And I'm glad you're here. I hope this place is always a place where people whose lives are devastated can come and just sit here. You're not going to hear anything I say today. You're just in shock. You're just here because somebody dragged you here. You don't want to be here. This all seems like an exercise in baloney to you. And that's okay. I'm glad you're here. I hope this is a place where anytime you're in shock, that you can say, that's a friendly place. We don't expect anything from you. We don't expect anything. You just come. Come here and drink our coffee. We're glad you're here. We're glad. We want to be a place where people whose life really seems upside down, you could come here. And we hope that you could find something, a ray of hope in your life. So I'm, gl I'm glad you're here. We'll talk about what to do when we're in shock. Not much, because you can't do much. And then we're going to close out our time by, I'm going into a crisis, and I don't know it. <laughs> Right around the corner. Happy New Year. Bam! Oh, jeez, I didn't expect that, okay? All right? What do you do? How can we prepare ourselves for that? And the Bible has some things to say to us. Uh, the Bible has some things to say to, to us to prepare so that our shock doesn't devastate us. Now, here's the deal. We're, why we're talking about this is because we're, we're, we're the church here, we exist. A lot of us here have come to the place in our life where Jesus is our leader and forgiver, okay? And here's what the Bible says to people who are following Jesus. This comes from, from the book of Galatians. The Apostle Paul says this, you read the yellow, share each other's burdens. burdens. Burden is when you get hit by a big boulder, a big rock. Bam! Just takes you out. And, and if you're a follower, if you're a follower uh, of Jesus, if Jesus is the leader of your life, then you have an obligation to help those people. Does that make sense? What's the option? We have an, uh, just let those people go. They're kind of messy. They're kind of high maintenance. No, no, no. no, no. When, you, when, you're, when, you're, when you have Jesus as the leader of your life, that's a command, by the way. It's in the command form. You have an obligation to help people who've been hit by a boulder. 
Help him. And then it says this, and in this way you obey the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, in the Bible, in Matthew, it says this. A guy came to Jesus. Hey, teacher, what's the greatest law and the commandment? That's of the commandments. That's good. There were 613 commandments. What's the greatest one? Jesus replied and says this. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He gave them two because they're all connected. Because you can't love God, say you love God, and not care about people. Intricately linked. And so this church has an obligation. We have an obligation to keep our doors open all the time to help anybody who walks in this, in this room. We, and and not, just let them, not just let them come to us, we have an obligation to go out and find people, find people who, who are hurting and, and say, you know what, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. So we're gonna talk about people who are in a crisis right now, okay? And there's three things we could do with them, okay? Three things, if you know somebody in a crisis, here's three things, simple but the profound, okay? Number one, show up. You could do that, because you're here today. And some of you don't look so good, but at least you're here, okay? You showed up, okay? Number one, just, just, just show up. I don't know what to say. Hey, guess what? You don't have to say anything. All you have to do is? Show yeah, don't say anything. Just show up. Just show up. Here, here's, here's the book of Job. Here, here's what happened. When, when, uh, Job, by the way, he got hit by a boulder. In one day, he got hit by a gigantic boulder. In one day, he lost 10 kids. Man, I hope I never have to bury one of mine. He did 10, 10 kids he buried, lost his job, lost his health. The only thing he had left was his wife, who turned to him and said, curse God and die. He's like, oh God, couldn't you take her too? You, know, <laughs> you missed one. <laughs> Get her out of here, okay? And, uh, and, and, and he's just devastated by this catastrophe. Catastrophe, and then it says this, when three of Job's friends heard, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back. Yeah. When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he suffered, they got together, and what they do? They traveled from their homes to comfort him and to console him. That's what they did. You just, you just show up. That's all you have to do. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't wait for an invitation. You just show up. What do you say? Nothing. In fact, here's the principle. I should have it up there. I don't. Here's the principle. The greater the grief, the fewer words need to be said. If a person's got a hangnail, talk to them all you want. Grow up. Don't be a sissy. Seriously. Come on. Put your pants on. Let's go. Okay? If they lost a mom, a dad, a kid, or a job, you go there and you say nothing. You just shut up. You just show up. Don't say a word. Just touch them every once in a while. Don't be scared. I'm okay. okay. <laughs> just touch them. If they're afraid to touch, just give them a fist bump. You, know, you don't want to hug a CrossFit guy. He'll kill you. All right? All right just, just give him a fist bump. Okay? Just, okay? just show up. My mom had a very close family. She had a couple sisters and a brother. We lived on the east side of town. They, they lived on the west side, so we would see them. But whenever somebody, a tragedy happened on mom's side of the family, we did, a, we, we did I thought was a weird thing, but a cool thing. When grandma died, mom said, okay, boys, get your sleeping bags. And we'd go over and sleep at the people's house. We'd just show up. It was powerful. Powerful just to have people around you. You know what I'm saying? Just, 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 we didn't do anything, just, just sleep. When my uncle was sick, just come on, boys, let's go. Let's go, we're going, we're going to sleep, sleep at their house tonight. And we'd just take our sleeping bags and just sleep, sleep on, on, on the floor. So we did. Just show up. Number two, you have to share their pain. Yeah, you have to share their pain. This is, this is what happened. This is what, this is what happened to Job's friends, okay? When they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. That's what shock will do to people. You won't even recognize him. Ah! Okay? And wailing loudly, they tore their robes and threw dust in the air over their heads to show their grief. Don't do that. Okay, that just, hey, here's some dust. Okay, that's an ancient tradition. We don't do it today to kind of make sure that you connected with people, that you're the same. We don't do that today. But they sat on the ground with him for how long? Seven days, se se seven days and nights. And seven days and nights, and they didn't say a word. I, I haven't sat with a person for one whole day and night. Are you all with me? Seven days and nights, they sat with him. No one said a word. For they saw that his suffering was too great for words. So you share their pain. 
you, you, you just be there. You don't say anything to them. Hey, I got a Bible verse for you. <coughs> they don't even know God exists. Hey, you want to come to church with me? Go to heaven and make a U-turn, okay? They don't want to do any of that stuff. They don't want to do it. Because they can't, they're in shock. Are you all with me? So you share their pain. You just be there with them. And you, and, and, and you, and you sit there with them and touch them and hug them and don't say anything. The greater the grief, the fewer the words are needed. And just share, share their pain with them. Just, just hang out with them and, 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 just, and just be there with them. Just be there with them. And by the way, when someone's in pain, you already know this, the whole family's in pain. The wife is and the kids are. Everybody's in pain. They're all in pain. So, so you got to be aware that number three, so, so number one, you show up. Number two, you, you uh, I didn't want to say shut up, but that's probably good, okay? So you just, you just, you just show up. And, and number three, you, 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 you take the initiative. You take the initiative. In other words, you, 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 this is the worst thing to say to someone in shock. Hey, if you need something, call me. <laughs> because you put the burden on them. You just take the initiative. So my family, we'd get to sleep, but we'd go, and then, and, then, and then we'd do stuff. Dad would cut the lawn. Son, take the garbage out. If it's a funeral, you shine the guy's shoes if he's a man. Shine his shoes. If you need practice, come to my house, okay? And they need some work, okay? Just do stuff, okay? You, 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 you don't say, hey, hey, can I do anything for you? They don't know. They don't even know what to do for themselves. You just take the initiative, and you give them options sometimes. You say, hey, I just cooked lasagna. When can I bring it over, Wednesday or Thursday? Don't say, can I, you want a meal? No, force it on them. Wednesday or Thursday. If I'm in shock, you call me when you're at the pie store. You know? <laughs> French silk or pecan, pastor. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's what it is. Yes. That's, yes. That's, what, that's, yeah, that's a yes. And, Get some ice cream on the way by. Oh, okay. okay. You, just take, you just take the initiative. You take the initiative. And, and, and you, don't need to, you, don't need to, you don't need to say anything. Clean their house. Wash the dishes. Do stuff. You, you, you take the initiative. Here, here's what the wisest man said. Don't, don't withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. Just, just do it. Just, just do it. So, so if you know somebody in shock and their world is turned upside down, you know, here, here's what we do. Number one, what do you do? Show up. Just show up. Just show up. We didn't call. We didn't call and say, hey, can we come over and stay? We just, we just loaded up. We go. <laughs> just go. Just go there. Then, then, then you share their pain. Share their pain. Sit with them. Don't need to say words. Hey, you want to listen to the sermon? <laughs> No, no, I don't. I don't even know if God exists right now because God's using us to work through us. You see what I'm saying? And, and number three, you take the initiative. You, 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 you help people out. Don't ask them questions. You know, that, that, that's what we do, okay? So, so if you got that, say, I got it. What do you do when you're in a catastrophe? What do you do? Well, uh, you, you don't do much because you can't do much. <laughs> Life is so dark, you can't, it's hard to get out of your house. What do you do? So I'm only going to give you two real quick things. Two real quick things, what you do when you're in a catastrophe. What you do when, when, when you're in shock and the world has kind of pulled the rug out from you. Number one, cry out to God. Just cry out to God. Just, just cry out to God. This is a verse that I have hung on to for a long time from the Psalms. It's, it's a powerful verse to me. There's a promise in there. I think we got it up here. And here it says, just as God's like, call on me when you're in, call on me. And I will rescue. I, 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 I beg God to answer that sometimes in my life. Rescue me! Hurry! And you'll, get, and you'll give me glory. You, you got you to cry, cry out to God. Like I said, life was good until I was 42, and then it sucker punched me, and then I saw this verse. I'm a good sleeper. I sleep good. I don't even need MyPillow.com. But boom, I'm out. I'm good. I'm a good sleeper. Until I was 42 and I was in shock. And then I, this first came up to me, and, and, and I realized this, I was living it. If we could get there. We got it, TJ? TJ, if you fall asleep on it. Okay, there, okay, okay, okay. Rise during the and cry out. Why do you rise during the night? Because you can't sleep. 
Rise during the night and cry out and pour out your hearts like water to the Lord. 42 years old, my life turned upside down. So I would get up. I couldn't sleep. I'd get up in the middle of the night. And I don't know, I'm weird. But I'd go downstairs. I don't know why I did this, but I did. And I would lay underneath the dining room table face down. Maybe I thought I could find some crumbs there. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and I just said, God! Ah! Oh, you got to help me! You got to help me! I want to die right now. Just cry out to God. Just cry. I, I would be weeping underneath my dining room table. Just asking God to give me the will to live because I didn't even want to live. I didn't want to live. And then I'd say, oh, oh, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be a bad day if I don't get to sleep. And so I'd go back upstairs and I'd lay down for two minutes. Have you, have you ever been there? I, said, I, can't, I can't do this. And I'd go back down underneath the dining room table. Are you going to rescue me? Last year, I, I, gave, I, gave, I gave a message called, Just a Groan Will Reach the Throne. Just a groan. I don't know what to say. Don't say anything. Just cry out. Ah, this hurts. Hurts. You got to cry out. You got you to cry out to God. You got to cry out. He says, he says, he will rescue us. Are you all with me? I stand before you today. I stand before you today. I mm. hope I could say this without emotions because I'm a man. But, uh, but um, I came this close. If there were ways, maybe I would have done it. And I stand here today and say, thank you, God, that I didn't take that path and you rescued me. Thank you that you were faithful to me when I didn't know that you were. Are you all with me today? I thank you, God. Thank you that you, you rescued me. And number two, you, this is hard. hard. This is the harder one. You got to let others help you. It's hard because when you're in shock, we want to isolate. When I, got, when I got laid off from work, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I felt like I could walk into a room without even opening up the door, just go and walk underneath it. I felt that big. And so when, 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 when shock hits us, we feel like we're losing in life. You don't want to be around people. You just don't want to be around people. Just stay away. Just stay away from me. I, I don't want to. And, 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 and here, here's, a, here's a great verse. I love this verse. I didn't understand it when I was younger, but I got it. I got it when I went through hard times. A friend is always loyal. And a brother is born to help in time of need. You know what that means? That the closest relationships are born and birthed in adversity. Are you with me? When you're going through hard times and someone walks with you, that's better than a biological brother. They're with you. I got it. God, that's good. So you got to let other people in. Got to let other people in. Scott, Scott's sitting over there. I just greeted him. When I had a hard time when I was in Colorado, I, was like, I don't have family here. I don't, ha I don't have time. You know, I, I mean, I don't have family here. And I was going through a dark time in my life in Colorado, and I called him up, and, you know, and he goes, how you doing? I, I, I hesitate. He's a sensitive guy sometimes. And, um, and he goes, I think I need to come over. And he got in his car and came right over. Are you all with me? Are you, you all with me? That was great. That was great. That, that was fantastic. And Scott just sat with me. Scott didn't, Scott, didn't, Scott didn't have words of wisdom. I mean, usually you do, Scott. Usually you do. But I mean, that, that night, I, I, he, just, he just sat on the couch with me. That was a friend. And, and Scott, Scott, he doesn't know this, but I have a brother, biological brother named Scott, who passed away. But that Scott is closer to me than my brother Scott. Okay? And, and one more thing, and you, you already know this. You, you don't, you don't want to make any major decisions when you're in shock. Okay? Oh, well, I think I'll move to New Mexico. Why would you do that anyway? You know what I mean? I mean, I mean you, you don't want to do that, okay? Okay? You don't want to do that, okay? Now's a good time for the divorce. <laughs> no, not, no, not really. It, you, you may need to. I don't know. But now's not the time. Not the time. I'll quit my job. No, 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 no. You need to hang on to that thing, okay? Don't make any major decisions, okay? It's tough. So if you're going through a crisis, if some of you here are in a crisis right now, I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy you're here. Thank God you're here. In fact, if you're in a crisis right now, we just want to ask God to 
to help you. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to bow our heads and close our eyes just for a second. We're not closing yet. But if you're in shock, we want to pray for you. And, and one of the ways to cry out to God is just take an outward step. So I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. Every head's bowed. If you're in shock right now, I just want to have God put his hand upon you and pray for you. And I want to pray for you just in this room here and ask God to remind you that he's a God of hope. So if you're in shock, just stand up right now. Just stand up. Just if you're in shock, just stand up. Just stand. You're courageous by standing. I know it's hard, but I applaud you for your strength by standing up. I applaud you. The Bible says when you draw close to God, his promise is he will draw close to you. He will. He will. He will. Father, thank you for every person standing. Thank you. I pray that they would know that you love them. I pray, Father, that you would let them know that you're going to get them through this. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with us. Thank you. Thank you. I pray every person will know that you're with them. I pray that you'll protect their heart against the lies that want to come in when we're in shock. I don't matter. I'm not lovable. I'm not good. I don't have what it takes. I'm a failure. No one loves me. I'm all alone. Protect them from all the lies and let them know that you're a God who cares for them. That standing right now is the daughter of God. Standing right now is a son of the Most High God. And speak to them of powerful words. Let them know, Father, that you're still on the throne. You're still God. And you have a way, even though the darkness may seem profound, we thank you today that light is greater than your darkness. Thank you that grace is greater than sin. And so I pray that for the people who are standing, that your grace would flood their hearts right now. And remind them, Father, of the words of Jesus when he stood at the tomb of his friend and tears were rolling down his cheeks. He said to those people, I am the resurrection and the life. There's still hope. It's not over. We look at it from an earthly perspective. Help the people that are standing look at it from an eternal perspective. You're still God. And your plan is good. And you make all things work together for good. And when the darkness envelops these people that are standing, remind them that your hand, they can't even feel it or see it, but your hand is on them, guiding them through the valley and through the darkness. And you're going to put their feet on high ground. Why? Because that's the way you are. You promise you will rescue your people. So I pray for your presence to be upon these people in a powerful and profound way this morning. May they know that God, you God, have your hand on them and your grip never slips. It's there. And so give them the hope to keep moving on. Remind every person standing of the promise that you give us strength for the day. Yeah. They got strength for Sunday. They got strength for today. And when Monday comes, there'll be a gift. Strength for Monday. Every day they got your strength to get through. No situation is hopeless. No situation is overwhelming. Because God, you're on your throne. And you're victorious. And you're all powerful. Move in the hearts of these people. Heal them. Love them. Comfort them and surround them with your presence. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can grab a seat. Thank you for standing. Thank you. Thank you for those who stood. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us as a church to step into the sacred place of your soul. I'm humbled by that. We're honored by that. And we want to always take that um, with a great deal of responsibility and care. You matter. You matter to God, and you matter to us. And we want you to know that. So thank you. I want to introduce you to a great friend of mine. Fantastic friend. He knows about adversity. He knows about getting punched in the face. And sometimes when adversity hits you, sometimes it's literally a matter of life and death. Literally. About eight and a half minutes. Watch the screen. I want to introduce you to my great friend, Matt Kanega. My name is Matt Kanega. Um, me and my family moved here to Loveland in 1994. Uh, went to Thompson Valley High School. And in 2003, 
Uh, upon graduating Thompson Valley, uh, I joined the Marine Corps. At the time, my relationship with God was, I, I knew there was a God. Uh, when I was seven years old, you know, I prayed to Jesus uh, to save my life because I thought there was a monster chasing me in the desert. Um, but, but there wasn't really a relationship. My unit uh, left Camp Pendleton in February and we were in Iraq by March. You know, I was deployed to a city of Ramadi, the city of Ramadi. Over the course of seven months, uh, out of the 1,000 Marines that deployed to that city, uh, 36 Marines were killed in action and uh, 268 of us were wounded. I was wounded by a hand grenade that an insurgent threw into my patrol. Um, I saw the hand grenade come into the patrol and, and it exploded, uh, sent shrapnel into my leg and my back. Some of the lowest points of my life because of the loss of friends, the um, people getting wounded, you know, I see a guy one minute, you know, joking with him and then 20 minutes later, you, you hear that he's been blown up. Upon my return from Iraq, uh, things were, were very difficult. I was still in the Marine Corps. I was a corporal now and had a lot of responsibility. I was in charge of a, of a section of Marines. During that time, uh, alcohol became a big part of my life. Uh, it's how I coped with being scared in the middle of the night. It's how I coped with stress or anger. Um, ended up getting a lot of fights and a lot of drinking. Shortly thereafter, I met my future wife, um, Christy, and we started dating. And um, immediately deployed to Okinawa, Japan, where just more of the same, more uh, drinking, just blowing my money. Very, you know, very mature time, and, and God was nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Well, upon leaving my last deployment to Iraq, I came back to Pendleton, and and I was discharged from the Marine Corps. I decided to leave and, and not re-enlist and, and come home. And I came home uh, to a real bad situation with me and my wife. Uh, we were not doing well, just as you would expect if, if you get married and are gone immediately for nine months separated, it can be really stressful on your family. So me and my wife, you know, we were trying to work together and, and keep our marriage together, but my anger and my drinking had, had not gone away, still present. Me and my wife were on the verge of a divorce and we were introduced to a couple uh, that were counselors, Mary Jo and Chuck. And they started meeting with us um, and they were in their 70s and me and my wife were in our early 20s and they were counseling us and, and we would, you know, they would, they would bring us into their home and, and they would pray. They would pray with us, and I, and I would pray kind of. I, I just didn't care about God at the moment. Little did I know he was working to, to save my marriage. Fast forward to 2011, uh, I have graduated the police academy. I had taken a job with the Larimer County Coroner's Office, and you know things are kind of on the uptick in my life. And on July 4th, uh, 2011, I was laying in bed and uh, I just felt a pull in my soul to talk to the Lord. I, I was just laying there and I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but something in, something in me told me, you need to talk to God right now. And so I did, I, I spent 30 or 45 minutes talking to God. The very next day, I was involved in, a, in an incident with my father where you know, my father had suffered a stroke in 2008. Uh, the day that my daughter was born, the day that Holly was born in, in, in 2008, my, my father had suffered a stroke. And, you know, he was never the same after that. It, it, it drastically changed his quality of life and his personality. So on July 5th in 2011, uh, my father was, became irate and he uh, ended up coming to my home with a firearm after threatening my wife and, and me. During that incident, uh, I was forced to protect my own family and my home, my wife and children who were sitting on the couch uh, with deadly force, unfortunately. And uh, my dad, uh, I ended up having to, to shoot him 
uh, to protect my family. And as I you know, went to the police station to give my statement about all of the events that had occurred, um, I thought about the night prior. I thought about this, this odd thing that had happened just you know, 10 hours earlier, 12 hours earlier, where I had, you know, I had this, this pull to talk to God. And in my opinion, it was God telling me, preparing me for what was about to happen. That moment was a, change, a turning point in my life. You know, I was, I was found, the, the district attorney said that, you know, my, my that incident was justified self-defense. Uh, but that's still something I carry with me every single day of my life, I think of my father. So everything, after everything with my dad, and, and really after coming back from Iraq, things were already hard. They were tough, it was a tough transition. Nothing was really going well in my life. And then you, you add on everything that happened with my father, and it was a really difficult to get through every day. And so what I did, here's, here's who was my MO? Bottle everything up, push everything down, put on a good, a strong face, and go to work the next day, hug my wife and kids, say it's gonna be fine, not knowing if it was, you know, and just pushing through, pushing through. Not, not gonna talk to anybody about it, not gonna talk to counselors about my problems, uh, or about Iraq or any of my experiences. Um, wasn't gonna talk to anybody about what happened to my father. And, you know, I, I felt that was a, a personal thing. Um, and what that led to was isolation. And, and isolation was safe, but it didn't work. It protected my image, it protected who I was, um, but I was dying inside. And so by going into the Grace Immersion Groups, by going into the Crucible Project, by going to journey groups, and you know, I started to realize that I carry around this weight in my soul of these things that I'm enduring, that I think I'm enduring alone. I'm by myself. If, it, if, if these people knew what I was doing or thinking or, or what I thought, they would shun me. They wouldn't want anything to do with me. And so I just buried it deep. And through this process, over these past four years, five years now, God has been slowly breaking these walls down so that, so that I am a more available person, so that I don't bottle everything up. I share these things. I don't, I don't isolate myself so that I'm fighting this battle by myself. I surround myself with strong men and women who can build me up and, and help me get through these fights. You know, I think a lot of people try and get through these hardships alone, and, and that's, that's a rough thing to do. It's a rough thing to go through the hardest fight of your life by yourself. Me and my wife are still married now. It's been 10 years, coming up on 11. We have our three children. I'm gainfully employed, and all I can tell you is that it's good now. Life is good now. We have more blessings than we know what to do with. Um, but that doesn't mean it's always gonna be. You know, I work at the coroner's office for Larimer County, and unfortunately, a lot of people who are gonna see this video, I've had to stand in their living rooms and, and talk to them about some pretty terrible circumstances that they're going through. And so hardship is everywhere, and it's not gonna go away anytime soon. Um, so we should be preparing ourselves while we can. And if you're in a fight right now, which a lot of us are, I think if you look to your, if these people would look to their left and right, right now they would find that if they heard the story of everybody in this room, they'd be blown away, be broken for a lot of people. You know, when you're in a good part of your life, when things are sail smooth sailing, that should be an opportunity for you to be equipping yourself, to be training yourself, preparing yourself, you know, learning the word, putting on the armor of God, because the battle is coming. And so it does you no good to kind of revel in, and sit in the good place. You should be preparing for the hard time because it's coming. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, you will have hardship in this world, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And we're not guaranteed a rose garden. We know it's gonna to be tough. Mm, that's Matt Kanega. He's a, he is an overcomer. He's an amazing, amazing man. Yeah.
Is Matt here? Is Matt here today? Matt? He'll come next. He usually comes to late service. He sleeps in. So uh, anyway, uh, you see Matt, you give him a hug. He's a tough dude, and God's doing some great things. We never tell a person what to say. We just want to capture their stories, and he finished my message for me. So let me just say what Matt just said. Two things. How to prepare for a shock. How to prepare. How to do, and, and Matt already said it. All right, Matt, Matt, Matt just clearly said it. So let's close out by saying two things you need to do to prepare for, for an emotional catastrophe, okay? Two things. Do we have it up here? Okay. Number one. Number one is I want you to cultivate how to prepare. Number one, cultivate strong relationships. Cultivate strong. We already talked about this. That's what Matt said. That's what, Matt got, out, that's what got Matt out of his darkness. Just getting out there, just saying, okay, okay. And it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, hard. And someone told me that if you, if you look for a friend, you'll never find one. They're hard. But if you want to be a friend, they're all over. So, so cultivate healthy relationships. You, you know, here's what I discovered, that, 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 the, that the church, the, the, in, in the Bible it's called the body, the family of God. Here's what I discovered, that your spiritual family is greater than your biological family. Because your biological family won't always be with you, even though you think they might be. Divorce, move, die, all this stuff. But I, I, when I moved away when I was 17, here's what I found out. I got people in my life right now who are stronger than anybody in my biological family. Are you all with me? And when I moved away to Chicago, I had them. When I moved to Iowa, I had them. When I moved to here, I got people in my, the, the spiritual family. You got to cultivate strong relationships. Here's, here's what, here's what uh, Solomon says. Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, two people are, are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help them. But, but someone who falls alone is in, in deep doo-doo. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. Now, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord can't, can't be broken. Cultivate, cultivate good, good relationships. Everything we do here is designed to help you get to know people. It's good. And number two, cultivate spiritual roots. You, you don't, you, 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 we're made to be in relationship with God. And so you got to take time to connect with God. <laughs> know this book. The book, is not a, the book is important because it points us to Jesus. Don't, don't know the book for the book's sake. Know the book for who it connects us to. Know this book. Study it. Get to know it. Read it. Spend time with it. Study it in a group. That's powerful. Powerful. You don't want to be a spiritual tumbleweed. Does that make sense? Just blow away whenever, whenever life helps you. Then you get bitter. You want to have some deep, deep roots. Here, here's what. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. This is from, this is from Jeremiah. He says, they are like trees. I like this. This is what I want to be. Planted alongside a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Reach deep. Such trees, trees are not bothered by the heat. Come on. Bring on the heat. Come on. Come on, bring, and, and, and they're not worried by long months of drought. That's okay, I'll, I, because their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Deep fruits bring lots of roots. No, no, wait, wait. Did I say that wrong, didn't I? Yeah, deep, hold on, let me get it, let me get it, let me get it, I'll get it, got it. Deep roots bring lots of fruits. It's the bounce that counts. See, that's catchy. You'll like that. You'll catch on. Deep roots bring you fruits, okay? Deep roots, okay? Worship team, come on up here. Come on up here. I want us all to be strong. When we get punched in the face, we know how to handle it. I want you all to stand. Stand together. Stand together. Just for a second, hold hands. We're not going to do it. We do this every year. We're just going to do it. But the, the, the tallest things that grow, the tallest things that grow, in the world are redwood trees. Over 400 feet. 400 feet they grow high. They're big. They're big. 400 feet. And when scientists studied them, they were confused because usually as trees grow big, their roots, their roots grow deep. Not redwood trees. Their roots are very shallow. How do they stand the winds when they come off the Pacific Ocean? They found out that redwood trees grow in gatherings. You know what the word in the Bible is for gatherings? Church. Redwood trees grow up in a church and their roots grow sideways. So when the winds blow, they hold each other up. Are you all with me today? Hold each other up. A big storm just happened in, in California a week ago. Here's what happened. That redwood tree blew down. See, hardly any roots on that redwood tree. Hardly any. No roots. Why did that redwood tree fall? Because it wasn't 
growing in a gathering. It had no church. And when the winds came last week from the storm, boom, down it went. I don't want that to happen to anybody. I don't want that to happen to anybody. So here's what Paul says in Colossians. He says this, just as you accept the Christ, we talk about it all the time, you need to accept Jesus. He says, the leader of your life, he's the one who made you. But just as you fight, he says, but then you also must continue to follow him. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Let your roots grow deep. Let your life be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Accept him, but keep pursuing. So your roots grow deep. We're going to close the song. My kids like this song because when I play, when it's on, they say, they blast it. They have me blast it. And so it's called Chain Breaker. This is when you have a chain. God's a chain breaker. When you get lost, He's the way maker. When you feel pain, he's the pain taker. That's who he is. Okay? So we're going to sing this song. And then there's, and in the chorus it says, some, if you see it, if you feel it, if you believe it, someone testify. And if you can testify that God delivered you in that part of the song, just raise your hand up. If you can't, just keep your hand down. But look around the room and see how many people have been delivered by the chain breaker. Because if he did it for them, he can also do it for you. Okay? All right, Scott, you ready, your team? By the way, Scott, have I told you lately that you're doing a fabulous job? Yeah, you've been amazing, yeah, yeah. Your team is fabulous. Ashley, Ashley just signed a contract in Nashville. That's amazing. So, remember us when you're big, Ashley, okay? Come on back to little Loveland. Throw us a bone, okay? All right, okay? All right. Now, the 4.30 service last night, there are 4.30 people usually no energy in the room because they, you know, okay? okay? But spontaneously, they started clapping, which means they were raised Pentecost. Okay? okay? So I would stay up here and lead the clapping, but I'm a redneck white boy. Okay, I got no rhythm at all, none. I just don't have it, okay? All right? So you were clapping. Ashley, you lead us in clapping, okay? We're gonna sing the song. We get to the chorus about testifying. If God's <laughs> delivered you, you raise your hand. Let everybody know that God breaks chains and sets us free.